Mauricio Umansky went from a college dropout to the CEO and founder of the agency, star of Buying Beverly Hills, and most recently, contestant of Dancing with the Stars. Here's how his journey began. I'm your host, Rosemarie Miller, here with Mauricio Umansky, the CEO and founder of the agency and author of The Dealmaker. Thank you so much for joining me today. It's a pleasure to be here, Rosemary. This is exciting. Absolutely. So, Mauricio, is there anything else you'd like to add? To well, to, to what? To that title. To that title. Well, I mean, you know, I don't know. We can always add, you know, dancer of the year, um, entrepreneur. Um, I don't know. I think we'll leave it at that. We'll leave it at that? Yeah. All right. We're That's good. not what you told me before the camera started. Uh, uh, incredible uh, human. Uh, amazing man. Yeah. Like, yeah, no, we'll, yeah, we'll uh -huh. do it. <laughs> throw it out there. We'll just throw it out there. We can just <laughs> accolades and accolades, you know. Well, Mauricio. Let's leave it at that for now. <laughs> I want to start at the beginning. Yeah. Take me all the way back. Who is Mauricio Umansky? Wow. That's a uh, big question, you know, right off the bat. Um, you know, I was born in Mexico City. Um, moved to the United States when I was six years old. I was born with a blood disease, which is very important. Uh, it's part of my book. It's in my first chapter that uh, was a terminal disease that I was lucky enough to be cured. And the reason that's so important is just because of the way that my mindset is in terms of living, really enjoying every single day and every single moment of life, carpe diem, and really being feeling like I'm lucky to be alive. Um, and, uh, you know, fast forward to... Uh, you know, the, to, to, to the U.S. and, you know, obviously later on in life, um, I'm married um, with four beautiful daughters. And, um, yeah, I, uh, you know, I've, I've been an entrepreneur pretty much uh, all my life since I started in business. I dropped out of college mm -hmm. um, in order to start, you know, working. Uh, I started to work for my father selling peace goods, which uh, for some people that don't know what peace goods are, that's textiles, that's fabric for the fashion industry. Um, and then uh, through that process, I, uh, I actually began kind of my first entrepreneurial experience, which was to start a uh, uh, clothing line called 90265, which was the Malibu zip code. And I actually didn't start it. Um, I actually purchased it um, as it was already starting. And then I helped expand it and create it and all of that stuff, um, which was the Malibu zip code. We did well with that, made a lot of mistakes. I was young. We made a lot of mistakes, a lot of production mistakes, a lot of things. Uh, ultimately ended up selling it, uh, went through our first bankruptcy during that time. Um, and, um, you know, failures are always create experiences. Um, mm -hmm. You can't just, I mean, some people can't just always have successes, but uh, uh, some of the, you know, I think most incredible entrepreneurs have had many failures before they've ever done something incredible. Uh, and I have certainly have my share of failures. Um, you know, cut to then, uh, getting called by uh, one of the largest uh, fashion houses in Los Angeles at the time and asked me to start a division to basically knock off in, um, my clothing line 90265 and start something for them. Um, that did not work. They wanted me to start doing that with uh, woven textiles and my clothing line was about uh, knits. Again, I don't know if uh, that makes any sense to you, but that was uh, pretty much impossible to knock it off when you're using completely different fabrics. And uh, that... Uh, led to a, uh, a very important and memorable moment in my life, which was uh, uh, getting fired uh, from that job. I was 26 years old. Uh, I had just gotten married. It was 1996. I had just gotten married. I was with my wife, Kyle. Uh, we had just given birth to my daughter, Alexia, our second daughter, and, um, and I was out of a job, um, and I didn't have any money, and I was broke. Um, I, w I came home. I was bawling, crying, my eyeballs out. Uh, my wife could not have been more uh, supportive um, and said to me, this is an opportunity, let's go, you know, you've always wanted to get into real estate, let's, I'll support you, let's go get our, our real estate licenses together. We made it a date night, we went to uh, uh, Santa Monica College at the time, which was a junior college in Los Angeles, and uh, we made it a date night, we went out and, uh, and did it every week and ultimately got our real estate licenses together. Mm -hmm. um, and then that's when I, uh, my new career path started, which is uh, it being in real estate and, mm -hmm. um, and just doing, you know, obviously some incredible things. Through that career path, I made a promise myself to myself that I would never have a lesser year uh, in terms of production than the previous year. Okay, and I, yeah. let me stop you right there. Yeah, please, Rosemary, stop me. Sorry, you can, I can go on forever, as you can tell, <laughs> so you stop me. I want to go back 
to that transition from moving to Mexico yes to the United States you were young how did you identify yourself growing up did you identify more as what I'm Mexican I did you hang up hang out with Mexican kids or were you trying to merge into the American culture more so that's a great question I'm actually a Mexican Jew mm -hmm. um, and when we moved to the United States I did go to a um, um, a public school for I think it was one or two years I don't I don't recall um, and then my parents put me into a uh, Jewish private school mm -hmm. um, and so you know I was hanging out with a bunch of Jews <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and you know I identified as a Mexican American Jew and that's a lot of labels so <laughs> yeah. I've been able to identify as everything and anything so yeah. yeah and I love Mexico I'm a proud Mexican mm -hmm. I'm a proud American and I'm a proud Jew and what was high school like for you High school was a uh, was was was, was kind of cool. It was pretty uh, awesome. I I, I like to be an athlete. Um, I was not into uh, in high school. I was not that into girls. I was not that into school. I was not a very academic guy. I was into athletics. Um, I played every sport: mm -hmm. um, football, baseball, tennis. Uh, I was on the teams. You know, I was on the varsity football team. I was also a snow skier at the time. Um, we had a home in Vail, Colorado, at the time, and I used to ski a lot. Um, I tried to make the uh, yeah, the Olympic team. I was unable to make the Olympic team, but I did compete and went, you know, around the world competing in uh, in uh, in snow skiing, slalom, and giant slalom for one year, mm -hmm. and um, and that was pretty awesome. Um, if you had made it, do you think that would be your life today, an Olympian? Who knows? I mean, <laughs> I, uh, I I don't know if I, you know, I. You, you, <laughs> You can never, you know, one of the things that I have learned is that you can never go backwards and wonder, you know, what if or what could have been. Mm -hmm. You know, the only thing that's in our control is what can be and what is today and what can we do tomorrow. Um, whatever happened yesterday happened. Um, and, you know, we can choose to, to uh, uh, formulate ourselves as to our history and to what has happened in our history, or we can choose to be ourselves as to what we can control today and what we can do tomorrow. Uh, and I choose the latter. So, so I've never really gone backwards and wondered what, what, you know, what could have been. Well, I know we're in the back right now. We're at high school. Maurice, I'm good with that. Yeah. I, can still, so I can still talk about history. You can't <laughs> ignore history. Let's be clear. Mm -hmm. You can't ignore history. It's important. But, you, you know, to wonder and to have it shape your life and shape your personality is a totally different story. Uh, I see. I see. We only have one life. We've got to live it as is. We've got to yeah. live it. Well, Mauricio, so you're in high school. Did you even see yourself, did you always see yourself going to college, or were you always thinking, I'm a businessman, I'm a businessman in the back of my uh, yeah, High school, I wasn't thinking about that, uh, to be quite honest with you. I was just thinking about having fun. Mm -hmm. uh, um, I wanted to have fun, I wanted to be in athletics, um, and I'd like, I like I like to have fun and I'd like to be in athletics. I was not a partier, mm -hmm. but I did like to have fun. Um, but you knew you were going to college. I knew I was supposed to go to college, Okay. right? Um, and I knew I was going to go to college, but I didn't get very good grades, so I wasn't 100% sure I was going to college. <laughs> um, but yes, but I, I ended up, uh, actually after graduating high school, I think I went to college for one year. I went to a junior college for one year, if I remember correctly, and then I actually left um, with my cousin and with a whole bunch of friends, and this was a really important year. We actually left and we ended up going to a kibbutz in Israel, and we spent seven months on the kibbutz in Israel, which we volunteered at and worked at, and we went we went to three different kibbutz how did y'all make this decision so as an as a as a jew um it is very common to make aliyah and to go to israel particularly as a mexican jew not so much americans but uh, most places in the world um other than the u.s actually after high school um when you're 18 19 years old you actually go to israel and you spend a year there and mm -hmm. it's a very common thing um, and so we did that. It was very common. We did that. We went to three different kibbutz. I had some amazing jobs uh, volunteering. I worked in a hen house uh, where I caged 26,000 chickens in one night. Um, and that was a heck of an experience. I mean, when you talk, look at those shows and you say, what are the worst jobs you've ever had or what are the worst jobs you can have? I got to tell you something, 26,000 chickens one night um, is a really disgusting, intense job. You do not want that job. I believe it. I believe <laughs> it. And that built character, I imagine. All of that built tremendous amount of character, tremendous amount of street wisdom. Um, you know, after doing that for seven months, I went to go travel Europe for six months um, on a Eurail pass, and literally, you know, we would. Uh, 
My father gave us five, we, my father and his father gave us each $5,000 and they said return when you're finished uh, with the money. Mm-hmm. And uh, we made $5,000 last for 13 months. 13 uh, months. So uh, yeah, you can imagine we were working on $30 a day budgets, <laughs> yes. uh, volunteering and uh, it was pretty awesome. And uh, I mean, we, we did buy a Eurail pass and sometimes we would just go to the train station and look at the, look at the board and be like, uh, well, where can we sleep tonight? What's an eight hour? train ride and we'd look at it jump on the train at 11 p.m. and go to Helsinki and mm-hmm. let arrive the next day in Helsinki so that we could save money on a hotel and after <laughs> this did you decide okay am I going back to school or was this the end of school no that was the beginning that was the wisdom and tremendous wisdom then I went back to school you went back um, to school. then I went back to school I went back for one year uh, again Santa Monica College mm-hmm. uh, junior college uh, I did study, which is very important, so I'm not telling people not to study. Uh, while I was in college, in those two years that I did college, I actually finished my two years of college. The only classes I took were business classes. So I did do business law, business law two, accounting, economics. Um, I did not do bullshit classes. I did not do photography and astronomy. <laughs> um, yeah, I That's did. my whole major you're talking about, but okay. <laughs> well, my, my <laughs> point is for business, right? right like, and, and by the way, I actually did do astronomy, so I actually yeah. just lied, and I actually did do photography too, but whatever. <laughs> um, but uh, but I really made it a point to the classes that I took were, were what I wanted to do. And yeah. at this point, I wanted to get into business. At this point, you wanted to at get into At this point, I wanted to get into and business. And what, what made you realize that you wanted to get into business? Um, I wanted to make money. Um, mm-hmm. I wanted to make money. I wanted to control my own destiny. Uh, as I was doing this, and this is what's very important, as I was doing this, uh, my father called me up and um, said to me, Mauricio, uh, this is a, uh, um, there was a recession. Um, there was a very bad recession at that time. And um, my father had made a gamble on, uh, on, on, longing, on uh, going long on cotton. Mm-hmm. Uh, cotton went down, dropped tremendously in price. And we had a, uh, a major problem. And he called me up and he goes, Mauricio, like, we're out of money. Um, so, so you. like you got to figure out like you got to make a decision now. I'm no longer paying for you to you know yeah. fuck around. Pardon my language, but to screw mm-hmm. around. Um, and you're either got to go to college and like take it seriously and get it done, and I will figure out how to take care of that, mm-hmm. or time to get to work, but no longer you know playtime. Yeah. And I told my dad, and that was a great thing that he said to me. And I said to my dad, I said, uh, give me uh, give me the weekend to think about it. And I, I called him up on Monday, and I said. I'm ready to go to work. The weekend? Yeah. It took you one weekend to come up with that huge decision, a yeah. life-changing decision. Yeah. <laughs> what happened over the weekend? Yeah, I, I, I don't recall, but I just knew it, it, that, that that was what I wanted to do, and I knew that I was not going to take school seriously. Yeah. Um, and it was just not something that I was going to you know take seriously, and I felt that I had the foundation, and I wanted to get to work. I wanted to go make money. Um, and I knew that my strength was, I, I always knew that my strength was sales. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that's, that's super important for people to understand is really what is your strength and what is your passion. And how did you know that that was your strength? Um, I, I just knew it because I knew how to, I, I, uh, my mother, I grew up with a mother who was a psychologist and going to school as a psychologist and um, I really learned a lot from her in terms of how to read people and how to read a room. Mm-hmm. I learned a lot from my father in terms of how to sell and if you can combine the psychology on how to read people and how to read a room and how to understand that and you know how to sell and you can combine those two, you can be an incredible salesperson. So a nine to five never crossed your mind? Nine to five never crossed my mind. That was not my gig. So how did you, okay, decide, I'm gonna be a businessman, I know how to make money, but how did you actually go get the money? Yeah, well, I I, I went to go work for my father, and he gave me uh, the, you know, we were selling textiles, Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and he had uh, a bunch of salespeople that were working for him, and uh, I got all the bad accounts, or the accounts that the other salespeople didn't want, mm-hmm. <laughs> which I guess were the bad accounts. <laughs> and uh, and quickly, I ended up becoming his, one of his top salesperson with the bad accounts. And you were how old? I was 20, I guess three, 22. 22 no, 23. probably even younger. And how old um, was everybody else? Oh, in their 30s, 40s. Been doing this established for years. forever, yeah. Yes. And yeah, I was just... probably twenty two years old, maybe maybe not even that, because I, I did two years of college. I did a year in Israel. So, you know, graduate eighteen, nineteen, yeah, twenty one ish. Twenty one, twenty two. Twenty one years old. Yeah. <laughs> and you're you're beating out all the thirty, forty year olds. Oh yeah. Oh, geez. Beating them out quickly. 
quickly. Quickly. Quickly became one of his top salespersons. What challenges did you face? Were they jealous of you? You were a hundred percent nepotism, you know, some jealousy, and I was like, guys, and I, I was twenty one years old, but I was a very confident kid. Yeah. Um, my parents grew, uh, raised me with tremendous confidence, and I give them all of the credit in the world for giving me that confidence. So even though I was twenty one years old, I didn't look, not look up at my peers, and I was scared of them. I was twenty one years old, and I looked up at my peers, and I felt like I belonged there with them. I always felt like I belonged there with them, and uh, I looked at them all, and I said, guys, these are all the accounts that you none of you guys wanted. Let's trade accounts. I want your accounts. You've got mm -hmm. better accounts than me. You've got bigger accounts, better accounts. Um, I want those. Um, and sure enough, I started gaining some of the ones that they weren't selling. And I was learning everybody that, you know, was the big manufacturers in the, in the, in the city. And I knew how big they were. And I was studying how big they were. And I was studying who they were and what they were doing. And I started gaining some of those accounts. And I started to sell more, sell more, and sell more, and sell more. And so when did you leave your father's business? So we started, I, we then bought the 90265 clothing line. Mm -hmm. um, I found it. I was selling them piece goods. I was selling them textiles. They were having some issues. I really liked the line. I came to my father and I said, hey, dad, I really like this line. I'd like to buy it. I'd like to help them grow it, keep the people. Um, and, uh, you know, we can support them. You know, they're buying our fabric, right? Um, and so, you know, uh, it'll be an easy way to finance them. It'll be an easy way to get this whole thing going. We bought the company. And we grew that company. I think they were doing $300,000 of sales that year. We bought that company and um, I kind of took over the operations of that company and took over the sales of that company. And within two years, we grew that company from three from $300,000 in sales to $30 million in sales. Mauricio, uh, you're saying this like it's easy. And it like, was an incredible <laughs> thing. <laughs> <laughs> like, I'm, do you hear yourself? You're like, yeah, I just did this, I did this, I did the sales, I took over, we did it. Yeah. Give us some steps. How does someone do this? How does someone make those bold moves in their life? So, so a lot of it just, you know, it's, it's you got to be in the right place. Yeah. Um, you have to understand that that right place is there because a, a lot of us are at the right place. Mm. And we, we happen to be in the right, we just don't know what, we just don't see it. We don't see that right place. And then, and then when that door opens, a lot of us are scared to walk into the door and to walk into the room and then take advantage and then grab the bull by the horns and then, you know, do what you need to do. And all of these things, they sound easy. Um, and they are easy if you, make, if you take the steps. The steps being identifying the opportunity. From identification of the opportunity, um, opening the door. From opening the door, having certainty to go inside the room, okay? from being inside the room, having certainty in the understanding to now start executing on the plan that while you open the door and you're doing your due diligence, mm -hmm. you've created a business plan, right? That moment between one and the other. But you can never have you, the, the, the doubt, the doubt in any business, the doubt in yourself, the doubt in all of those things has to occur during due diligence, okay? Once you have passed the due diligence moment and you know that that is something that you want, that's when you have to have 100% certainty in, 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 in that. And you can never, ever redoubt yourself, okay? And, and if you don't doubt yourself and you go for it with 100% certainty, you will accomplish the mission. And if you have no fear, um, you have to have no fear, you have to have confidence, you have to have certainty, and then you have to execute. And all of these things, they, yes, they sound easy. And you know what? They're not, but they are. And they are because if you have no choice but to execute, and that is the only choice that you give yourself and you manifest that, you actually have the ability to execute. Because if you wake up every single day and your choice is only to execute and to finish and to sell, and that is the only choice in your head, you will get it done. And everybody that makes that decision can get it done. This is not unique to me. Execute. Make the choice to get it done. You have the clothing line. Was this the turning point that you realized, I'm, I'm making it in life, I'm doing this? Yeah, I was having a lot of fun during that time. And you know, I was a young man, probably 23 years old, 24 years old, with a clothing line and uh, running fashion shows and all kinds of fun stuff, you know, mm -hmm. and, and just having a really good time. Um, probably uh, uh, around 25 years old is when I met uh, my wife, Kyle. Uh, met her at a nightclub, fell in love with her right away. Um, right away, tell me about that. Yeah, I just <laughs> fell in love with her right away. I mean, we were. It was a summer. It was. Uh, 
um, World Cup. So what was that, 1994? Yeah, it was the World Cup, summer 94. Um, and um, yeah, met her at a nightclub and uh, just fell in love with her. She looked exactly like Demi Moore. <laughs> I grew up infatuated with Demi Moore. Um, then I was actually told that she was Demi Moore's sister, and then I was like, "Oh my God!" I mean, like, well, if I can't have Demi, let's have uh, let's have the sister for sure. <laughs> um, absolutely gorgeous, beautiful woman. Uh, fell in love with her right away, and um, yeah, I asked her out on a date the next day, or I think I was leaving to Acapulco. I came back a week later. I asked her out on a date. Yeah. And um, and we went out for lunch. I asked her to lunch, not to dinner, I, um, because it, for me it was very important that uh, if you liked somebody, if you, you you asked them on a date date, if you just wanted to take somebody to bed, you asked them on a night date. That was my philosophy. Mm. Um, okay, so. young twenty five year old Maurice. <laughs> <laughs> so okay. yeah, so I asked her on a date, went with her, and um, you know we fell in love day one. I mean, we really just fell in love with each other, and um, yeah. Yeah, that's 25. That's 25. This is 25. Yeah. Keep us going. What's next? Um, so we started dating. We, we um, my God, what is next? During all of this time, it all started kind of mm -hmm. happening. Yeah. The 90265 kind of, uh, the clothing line kind of fell apart. I was making a lot of production errors. I was selling a lot, but I was not able to deliver the goods. So I right. was having to take back a, a bunch of, you know, goods that I was delivering. And this is a little bit before everything came crumbling down at 26. Yeah, so we're at 25, things are... Things are good, you're on top of the world. Stopped, things are good, yeah. I'm running my own business, I'm 25 years old, I'm in love, I'm making some money, particularly for a 25 year old, I'm making a lot of money for yeah. a 25 year old. Um, not a lot of money for today, but for a 25 year old. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you're the man at 25, you're the man. I was doing just fine. <laughs> And um, yeah, then all of a sudden, you know, we made I made I made a bunch of production errors that started to kind of crash down on me. I ended up um, one of the buyers for nine. One of the buyers that used to buy she, Macy's. She was the oh, she was the buyer at Macy's, and she used to buy my goods. Um, said to me, Mauricio, you have no idea what you're doing, but you've got a good product and you really know how to sell. Why don't you just sell your company? And I was like, sell my company, like. I can actually sell a company? Like, no clue that I could do that, right? Uh, she goes, yeah, sell your company. I'm like, all right. Um, ended up selling the company. Um, didn't make a lot of money because I didn't know how to sell a company. Okay. <laughs> um, like, and, what, what were the mistakes you made? Well, again, I wasn't producing good, so the P&Ls didn't look good. And I basically, I didn't sell the Blue Sky. I sold the P&L. Um, and, uh, you know, knowing today that, you know, when you have a brand and a label and which we've created now with the agency, there is, you know, there's a lot more um, value in the intellectual property and the brand and the label and all of that stuff than, you know, I had anticipated. You know, when I sold the company, I only really sold the P&L um, and the P&L had losses. So I sold it for nothing. Right. Okay. Um, and I didn't realize that I had a, 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 an important asset. Mm -hmm. on my hands um, but you live and learn you make mistakes I, I believe in learning from your mistakes as much as you got to learn from your you know your achievements so mm -hmm. the failures are as important as the achievements and um, yeah and then I went to uh, I went to go work for the people that bought my brand my line worked for them for a little while I didn't really like that job uh, what's that like working from for the people who bought your brand. Yeah, it was weird, and that's why I didn't like the job. <laughs> I imagine. It was super weird. Yeah. I didn't like it. I didn't like it at all. Um, good people. Uh -huh. I just didn't like the job. Um, and then a, the largest company in California uh, um, at the time called me up and said, you know, will you copy? Um, you know, we want, we want to hire you, and we want you to start a division that knocks off 90265, the company uh -huh. you had. And we want to create something similar to that. We created a uh, a line called Sank on Sank, um, which was the uh, French, uh, you know, the Club Sank on Sank. So it was based from that. Okay. Um, it was a great brand, a great label. I created that, um, and I went to go work for them. But they, uh, again, we were in a heavy recession, and they said to me, Mauricio, we only have uh, credit lines to buy woven goods. We do not have any credit lines to buy knit goods. 
And I was like, well, shit. Like, you asked me to start my own, uh, copy my own company, and now you want me to start it with, you know, Wovens? Like, this is a knit company. I cannot do that. Like, it doesn't work. But I went for it. It mm-hmm. was a job. I needed it. At this point, you know, I had sold the company. I had spent, you know, my commissions and all that stuff and, you know, what have you, whatever sa- small savings I had. And I needed the job, and I went for it. And uh, and it was the largest company in the in, in it was the largest clothing company. I think it was at one point the largest employer in Los Angeles. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, and I, I I enjoyed getting that opportunity to work for a big company and understanding the way that they uh, managed all of their operations and their HR and their uh, the, you know the way that the company operated. I enjoyed learning from uh-huh. that. That was your takeaway from a nine to five. That was my takeaway exactly. Okay. So you got to have takeaways in everything, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, and I got a chance to see how how that big structure operates, mm-hmm. and I like that. I did like that a lot. Um, and from that structure, how are you using that today? What did what did you bring? I pulled you? a lot of that for today, and I've really? used a lot of that structure today. And I learned how to you know run a company from that nine to five. Yeah, I taught you how to run a company. Yeah, please elaborate. Um, yeah, just watching the operations, you know, your COO, the, the the chain of command, the org chart, you know, who reports to who, how do you report, how do you create an efficient, uh, scalable model. Uh, all of those type of things are the stuff that I learned, you know, from from being there. I was the division head, so I was kind of high up on the uh, on the on the org chart. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't remember who I reported to, you know, SVP. I, I I don't remember who I reported to, but you know, the person I was reporting to was one step down from the CEO, right? Okay. So I was, I, I guess, I was on the third ladder of the uh, of the org chart, um, but. Um, it, it was just a great, great experience to really understand how to operate a company properly mm-hmm. um, and the importance of, you know, of um, understanding what's important, you know, how to create, you know, uh, divisions and have, you know, proper P&Ls and uh, expectations. We call them rocks, uh, quarterly rocks. You know, our quarterly rocks is what we call them now, which is basically like what are our um, goals that we want to set for the quarter? What's the most important things, right? Um and, uh, and we have a meeting uh, every quarter, uh, every month, I should say. And uh, we, we check in on our, on our quarterly rocks. Are they still the right ones? Are we still succeeding? Are we winning? Are we failing? We check in on a weekly basis. Are we winning? Are we failing? Uh, and that, that way we're, we know exactly that the entire company and those quarterly rocks are then passed on to the entire company. So that the entire company from the top to the bottom understand what we're all trying to do, right? Okay. Like this is the five core things that are the most important things that we need to accomplish this quarter. The entire company knows that, Mm -hmm. right? There's a bunch of other things that each division needs to handle and smaller, more important stuff, et cetera, et cetera. But as a company, as a whole, we have have five important things that the entire company knows that we have to accomplish those five things this quarter. And are we winning or are we failing at those things? And then we can look at the next quarter and decide whether we change the rocks or we don't change the rocks or we failed, we won, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. And we're at the point right before things start crumbling down. Yeah, I mean, we're, we're right there. You know, basically then all of a sudden, boom, uh, 1996, uh, right before Christmas, again, recession. Uh, 1995, if you remember, was probably one of the worst recessions. And if you look at the uh, real estate world which I am in today uh, there was actually just a just a quick little side note there was a, um, a report that just came out that today um, this year the mortgage applications were lower than 1995 which was the lowest uh, uh, mortgage application ever uh, in history since you know whatever maybe the 30s or what whatever does that it is mean? Um, that the market's slow mm-hmm. <laughs> so this is not a good time to buy that's not necessarily true. Where the, when the market's slow, there could be opportunities. It's um, so you know we can get into that in a moment if mm-hmm. you want. But uh, yeah, um, there's always opportunities. I actually think that being a contrarian is probably one of the best opportunities in the world. So when people are mm-hmm. when nobody's buying, you when when nobody's buying, you buy. When nobody's selling, you sell. Um, and being a contrarian can be a really great way of making money. So you know most of the money is made on the buy. And if you can buy properly and you can afford to buy, um, you know, usually what happens in recessions is the prices go down. Mm -hmm. Um, And so when the prices go down, you can buy. Um, Right now, we happen to be in an interesting moment, which is that we're, we're, prices are are dropping. They're not dropping as much as they should, in my opinion, and interest rates are a bit high. So affordability is difficult because interest rates are high. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't mean you're not buying 
and doing making a good buy. So if you can afford to buy something cash for argument's sakes or with a very low mortgage and you can actually create that affordability, you actually might see some really great appreciation in some of these investments that are out there right now. And I actually think there's some really great opportunities out there. I've started to finally start looking at opportunities. I've been personally on the sideline for, for, for a period of time and now I'm starting to look at, you know, potentially starting to buy again. So that's that's kind of where I'm at. I, I think there's some good opportunities out there right now, mm. if you can afford them. You, yes, the worst are. mistake that you can make as real estate is overextend yourself um, and be forced to sell something from outside sources. What I mean by outside sources, I mean a bank with a gun at your head telling you, I want to get paid back the loan that you can't afford to pay me, and mm -hmm. therefore you have to sell now. Now the sale is not under your control. If you can control the outcome of the sale of your real estate, if you bought well, you will never lose money. If you bought well, you will never lose money. What are the three pieces of advice you would give to someone who wants to do what you're doing, who wants to be a business owner, own a major real estate broker, or even just be big in the entertainment world? Yeah, look, at the end of the day, you know, I think you have to find your passion mm -hmm. and really understand what your passion is. Um, and then you've got to dare to dream. And then once you dare to dream, then you've got to, uh, um, you got to manifest it, you got to create your mindset, and then you just, honestly, I mean, it just sounds so simple, but you just got to go for it. Um, it's, 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 uh, it's literally that simple. And in all of those, that, in that simplicity, there's a lot of complication in the middle of that. But mm -hmm. at the end of the day, if you can maintain it that simple, you can actually get things accomplished. The reason we don't accomplish things ourselves the reason humans, people, don't accomplish things is because we complicate them in our mind. Mm -hmm. And that complication, that, you know, turning and creating and this and that and all of that stuff, that's what makes it, you know, impossible to get things accomplished. You can simplify things and have a vision and know what you're wanting to, you know, what your vision is and have certainty towards that vision. And you go out, you wake up every morning, and you manifest it, and you execute it, you will accomplish your mission. Execution. That's the word. That's the word That's for the day. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining me today, Mauricio. Thank you so much, Rosemary.